Um, I, I, get, I wanted, though, there was one thing, being a media person for 40-plus years, uh, and I wondered about that, because media is very, very powerful, and, you know, it can, uh, can uh, d d tease your brain. And uh, actually, if you believe what you write and see in a, in, a, in a newspaper or even when I talk and you're watching it. So the point is, is that and people don't understand that it's something written. But I sort of recollect, if you don't mind, just maybe you could help clarify this, um, that after sort of that assassination time, and I'm not a history buff, but I, I remember somebody saying that uh, then it was uh, in, in the newspapers and that helped to, uh, to spark the, the World War. Was it a newspaper thing or was it just that time? I, I, I don't know the history of World War I, but, um, but somewhere I remember that an article in the newspaper, I don't know, maybe it wasn't accurate or as, as so often things aren't accurate because in essence you've got to just follow your own heart is my belief of what situations are because media is very powerful and it can you know, make people think a certain way the way the, that writer and that producer and that owner of that media decided to allow the message to come out. And am I off here? Am I? Uh, Paul, I'm not aware of that. It's something. Oh, that okay. I, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I just wondered about it, uh, being a media guy. Um, what I would like to add to what I please, said before please, about the role of the Habsburgs sure, today, please. Uh, Otto, who was a son of the last Emperor Charles, he spent basically his whole life working on behalf of the Pan-Europa movement founded by Gudenhof Kalergi and which had uh, and has until the present day plays a major role in uh, originally trying to unify Europe and therefore their peace come, comes in again. And he really spent all his, his life trying to rope in the Eastern European um, countries back into Europe. And he was uh, very successful in his undertaking. And the present head of uh, our family, the eldest son of Otto, Charles, really is an ambassador at large, uh, an international ambassador, because he travels nonstop talking about the concept of pan-Europa today. So uh, he, um, not being a politician himself, uh, he was briefly member of the uh, Strasbourg uh, European Parliament. Um, but uh, that is what he spends his entire life. He has dedicated his life to peace. Obviously, a uh, do-good <laughs> family. Uh, actually, you you also inspired me. Actually, the moment I walked in here, you said you should know something about my son. Yes, indeed. In the Sudan. Uh, if you allow me, my I'm um, I'm immensely proud of all my three sons, but uh, my middle son is very much involved with what you are involved with. He. Uh, loves animals first of all that's what attracted him to africa originally oh, right. uh, he worked for four years in swaziland on a photo safari farm and ended up in uh, nairobi working with the catholic church um, bringing um, provisions and medicine to southern sudan uh, he got very much involved personally, met a beautiful Sudanese, South Sudanese girl, a Dinka, from the Dinka tribe, and uh, tall and black, um, who became the first black African to join the Habsburg family. So we have a black archduchess and the children, uh, four children, who are Archdukes, all of the descendants of the emperors are archdukes today. But uh, what is interesting in this uh, man's career is that he um, now spends six months of the year in Juba, in the capital of South Sudan, and uh, it acts as originally worked for UNDP, for the United Nations. Um, trying to bring peace to southern Sudan, so to bring the, the warring parties together. Originally, they, they fought against the north. Now they fight against each other, and he is uh, part of the conciliation movement, acts as consultant to the government and to the churches in order to bring peace to southern Sudan. And he is dedicated to that heart and soul.
I love it. We love it. Now, you gave me an example of how he wanted to help somebody without even knowing pretty much anything about us. <laughs> and uh, uh, that one of the things you said, something where uh, there was a girl, if I recollect, that uh, needed... Uh, uh, well, uh, in this case, uh, I received an email from him this very morning who says that one of his colleagues on the committee of um, um, uh, of this this organization helping southern sudan who lost a limb and who uh, needs a, uh, a prosthesis how would you call it a think. prosthetic and he is fundraising for her so um, there are such huge needs yeah. in southern sudan uh, and uh, this is just one case amongst thousands uh, where he is involved and wishes to involve others in raising the profile of the needs uh, in that part of the world. Okay. Well, you know, in our, I showed, uh, I showed you our, our uh, sizzle reel for our World Peace Day event, and uh, and and, and uh, Dr. Jane Goodall says something we can do better <laughs> and uh, let's all do better and uh, we're going to put something up about that uh, uh, prosthetic uh, limb for that that nice woman there and see if there's anything we can do for Thank that you, Paul. Um, and uh, I think the the lot of lot of lot of lot of good things here Give me uh, some background on, on Fabergé, because uh, this is where we are, and uh, thank you, Fabergé, for allowing us to be here. Um, uh, it's a brood of a company. No, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very interesting. Fabergé uh, is, uh, w originally was the greatest jeweler of all times. This is back in pre-First World War days, pre-revolutionary days. And he worked for the two last towers of Russia, had an, a, a, a gigantic, the largest empire in production of jewelry at that time in Russia, uh, with outlets in England, uh, with sales teams selling to Americans, to the Far East. But all that finished. I mean, he is best known, of course, for the imperial Easter eggs, the 50 uh, eggs, some of which today are worth over $50 million. Um, so um, quite unbelievably amazing. All that ended in 1920 when Fabergé died. And the company has been brought back to life by a group of uh, South African investors uh, in the diamond mining business. And they have um, uh, brought back to life this company, producing at this stage only high-end jewelry, but with the intention of uh, producing objects of art like Fabergé did himself. And we are now owned by a company called Gemfields. Uh, with major mining interests in Zambia, in emeralds, uh, and in Mozambique, in mainly in, in rubies. And uh, where they come into the picture that we are discussing today, they, they also have their leitmotiv, which is sourcing stones from their mines, uh, ethically, meaning that w we don't want to be involved with blood stones, blood diamonds or blood precious stones, and that is Fabergé's little role in uh, the context uh, of uh, world peace, of using really clean stones that, uh, that uh, help the economy of the countries and are not involved with corruption as in most, uh, uh, so many African countries. So the first place I saw an egg <laughs> was uh, Stephen Forbes to take me down to the Forbes, I guess, gallery, I believe it was it's called on Fifth Avenue, and uh, I don't know if it's actually still there, but... Uh, 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 Paul, the, you're speaking of the past. First of all, Malcolm it's, Forbes it's like is no longer. Uh, Steve Forbes, whom you know, and who was the eldest of the four brothers, um, they put up the entire Fabergé collection for sale. Uh, this we're talking of 2004, and it was uh, it was acquired in toto, which was very nice and beautiful gesture, by one Russian entrepreneur, one would call them oligarchs today, Viktor Vexelberg, who decided, who wanted, um, by acquiring the collection before the auction at Sotheby's. Uh, to keep the collection together and present them to the Russian state 
as a means of his contribution to bringing back what the Bolsheviks sold back in the late 20s and early 30s. And so these things are now exhibited in St. Petersburg oh, okay. um, at a museum called the Fabergé Museum in a very lavish palace. I'm on the advisory board of that museum, so I have the pleasure of seeing the Forbes things every time I go. So it went back home. Yeah, it went back home. All right, good. <laughs> As maybe sometimes things should. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing because, it, you know, I wanted to say earlier on, you know, uh, uh, artists, besides the display of the artists, the artists are peaceful. I, we've done shows with Artists for Peace. Uh, you know, artists are crafts people of the world. You know, in many cases, uh, underappreciated, uh, uh, living a life of uh, not always being successful financially, but successful uh, uh, passionately, let's say, and emotionally. And by, by, by people like you and your family for all those years, uh, you've given many a people, and then as a result, because it's all about paying it forward, Every artist's collection, any piece that you've ever acquired over all these 700 years, let's even say, has, if we did shows, the ripple effect of how that's affected the family, somebody's uh, notoriety had improved, someone's financial condition improved, art is a beautiful thing. Art, yeah, <coughs> absolutely well said. Um, some of the greatest artists of their time, I'm thinking now in particular of uh, Titian. Titian's greatest masterpieces were created for Emperor Charles V and uh, Philip II. And, Philip, uh, and Titian lived off the fact that the Habsburgs were his main clients. So he was able to live comfortably in, uh, in Vienna. That's one, amo one example amongst hundreds. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, a lot of, lot of do good things. So I usually ask everybody uh, two questions. One is, one, what is good news for you? Uh, good news. Uh, you, uh, you should have prepared me for that. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Good news is what we have already discussed. Uh, um, being in touch with somebody like my son in uh, southern Sudan and trying to help him and seeing what he is capable of doing. Back to the family. Uh, and, and the last question I have asked thousands of people, you know, what is peace? What, what is peace for you? Uh, I'm a Catholic. For me, um, peace is really the main purpose of or one of the main purposes of the Catholic Church. So part of the good news, which I did not mention, is uh, Pope Francis. And Pope Francis uh, nonstop preaches peace. And so does the Catholic Church. So for me, that is really part of my being. And uh, we all work in our little way. You do, I do, I try. Um, and play our little roles in um, anything to do with bettering the world. The brilliantly stated. I, I'm only going to add, I sometimes don't add anything, but I, I'm going to only, because you brought up the Catholic, I'm an interfaith minister, and our audience knows that, and uh, I'm loving of, of all religions and in and, and peace. And so uh, someone gave me uh, the, the Good News Bible, right? And, and initially, and very often, people say to us, you know, uh, are you a religious organization? Because the words, those two words, good news, are uh, associated by many, especially the Christians themselves, you know, as, uh, as your Bible, and uh, uh, as the Bible, I don't say yours, that's not maybe, uh, as, as a Bible, and as a, a book of, of, <coughs> of a learned uh, uh, intellect, I'm going to call it that. Um, um, and, uh, and I always say, you know, I almost was forced in saying, and I am happy with saying good news, and I'm not changing it, uh, even for those that say, well, you know, you shouldn't. Uh, I've had other, other religions say to me, well, you know. Um, because good news is good news, and we should stick with that uh, concept on a, on a broad, broad-based 
Um, and so we can share the good of the world. And, and forget about the, you know, I did it mainly because of bad news. Because when people say news, we've almost in our society, in our time, in our day, and the way, unfortunately, the media is in their mind forced to uh, hit you over the head, you know, so much that you're like, uh, you know, how do you go to sleep? Or how do you wake up? Um, there is more good news. Thank God there's more good news in the world than bad news, because if there was <laughs> everybody was fighting, we'd really be in trouble. <laughs> Thank God, indeed, as you say. Well, beautiful. What an honor. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, Paul. Thank you.